Before I begin reading the story that Bob has written, I just want to remind you of the setting. All of these stories are set between World War I and World War II at a weekend when um, Lloyd Robbins and his wife Annie are candidating at the church that they will ultimately be asked to come and Lloyd will pastor. So you're coming with me now to the ladies' tea where Annie is telling her story and Bob asked me to read this for him since it is written in Annie's voice. It's called Annie's Song. I want to thank you again, ladies, for inviting me to have tea with you. I've enjoyed chatting and getting to know a few of you, and I'm especially grateful for the lovely girls who are looking after little Lizzie while we're here. You've asked me to share something of my life and my walk with Jesus and how I met and married Lloyd. My Aunt Emily always said the best thing you can do in an awkward situation is tell the truth and trust God for the outcome. Parts of my story of my life have been a little awkward, and though I hope to be discreet, I need to tell you some so that you can see the work of God in my life. I was born in Bristol at the turn of the century. My father, Walter Woodward, worked as a clerk at the Portbury Dock. My mother is also from Bristol. She's known as a very quiet person, and it has often been joked that the longest public speech she ever gave was the I do at her wedding. But if you can make her say something, you will find that she is thoughtful and gracious. In addition to his work, my father was a junior warden of St. Paul's, one of the most famous churches in Bristol. As junior warden, my father oversaw the maintenance of that old building. He was first there in the morning and last to leave at night. It began, I hope, out of love, but it always came across as a dreary, frustrating burden. In fact, If I can say this carefully, our whole family's life lacked joy. The religion that bound our home was not the joyful life in Jesus I have since known, but more like a list of rules and duties. My older brothers and I were held to a high standard, and discipline was harsh if we fell short. Because of his position in the church, my father expected us to be model children, perfectly behaved and perfectly polite. It's not that my father did not have his good qualities. He works hard and is a faithful husband, and in his way, he really loved us. You should also know that in recent years, he has changed a lot and is learning about grace and joy and expressing love. But when I was growing up, those things were not very present. Oh, we were children, and so there were a lot of childhood joys in our lives. I loved my brothers, and they loved me. They looked after me at school, and we loved holidays together, especially the ones that we spent with Aunt Emily, my mother's sister. My dad got almost no time off work and had to be in church on Sunday, but Mum would take us up to Purton, near Swindon, for two wonderful weeks every summer. But at home, from the time that I was little, I was made to feel guilty and ashamed for every wrong thing I did, even if it was just childishness or awkwardness. I remember the time my father sent me for his paper, and when I reached up, I didn't see his tea sitting on it, and I pulled it over. I was burned and tearful, but Dad expressed his anger at my thoughtless clumsiness in breaking the teacup. So I had a spanking on top of my burned hands and arm, and three hours in the corner instead of breakfast. My dad rarely admitted that he was wrong or gave the benefit of the doubt. His way was the right way, and he was always the one wronged by other or the target of their malice. I don't know for sure why this was, but I know my granddad had often been harshed with him. They argued to the very day granddad died. All of this was bound, I guess, to affect my thinking. I loved my dad, but I often didn't like him. I loved my mom, but I was often angry with her because she was safe to rage at. Worst of all, I learned to see God as just a larger version of my dad. His rules were stricter, his punishments harsher, his love harder to earn. In fact, I felt that God hated me and I knew I deserved it. 
My father had told me enough times that God could see my thoughts, and they were filled with anger and despair, with plots of revenge and plans of escape. I broke his rules as often and completely as I could. I tried to look obedient when it served my purposes, but inside I despised my life and fully believed that God had already condemned me to a merciless hell. Oh, how I regret those years. When I think of the love and comfort and strength God wanted me to know, I just cry. When I think of how he loved my dad and my mom and my brothers, I weep for the chains that bound us. I regret the anger that I constantly felt and the shame that drove me to hate myself as much as anyone. I was 14 when the war started. My older brothers, Eric and Alan, soon joined up. My dad was proud of them and spoke more positively of them than he had in years. Their absence, though, made him focus more on my very real disobedience and disrespect. I now responded to his discipline with anger and screaming, which he took as a challenge, becoming harsher and harsher with me. But unknown to me, there was someone watching me from a distance. No, not Jesus, although he was too. It was my Aunt Emily. She owned a small bakery in Purton, and my cousin Niles was her main helper. Her husband, Uncle John, had died in an accident at the rail works. When the war came, Niles joined up, and Aunt Emily managed alone. But then the army opened a camp near Purton, and her business boomed. She needed help, and she knew of the tension I was causing in our home. So she and Mum persuaded Dad that I should live with her, so I could help her before and after school and on Saturday. Dad gravely announced this to me one morning, and I gave him the biggest hug he had had in years. Soon, I packed my things, and Mum took me to Purton on the train. And so began the revolution in my life. Whereas under my father, I had been angry and discontent, with the help of my aunt, I began to see what contentment, peace, and joy looked like. You see, Aunt Emily was also a person who took religion seriously. But in her case, it did not come out as rules and expectation and shame, but rather as kindness and love and caring and joy and love for beauty. My father had little patience for beauty and stomped on most of mother's attempts to appreciate it. But Auntie enjoyed it all. She loved the sights and smells of the bakery and the joy her products brought to others. But she also loved natural beauty, the flowers in the spring, the swaying fields of summer, the color of autumn, the snow-covered hills of winter. She had beloved walks all over the countryside and would often calm my anger by taking me on one of them by day or by night. Another source of beauty in her life, and soon in mine, was books. There was a sweet little library almost next to the bakery, and I often studied there. Books opened my eyes to a world I had never imagined in Bristol. I had not been allowed to read Shakespeare or Dickens or the classics because Father thought them worldly and said that the Bible was the only book we needed. He was right, but it was literature that allowed me to plumb the depths of what the Bible taught. These things made me yearn for, and to some extent appreciate beauty, but could not change the anger in my soul. I really don't know how Aunt Emily put up with me. I complained about everything and everyone, got angry or sullen whenever anything didn't go my way, and used language that would burn a sailor's ears. I was out of control. I would often flee the house and run out into the village and the surrounding hills. But Auntie was undaunted by this. She would give me a little time to cool down and then come and find me and gently help me talk it through. Her words and her faith and her example drew me to faith. She said she too had been an angry person, especially after the death of Uncle John. But through the ministry of Reverend B.C., she found forgiveness for her anger and comfort for her loss. After mourning came joy. 
joy in God and joy in all the beauty that surrounded her. Gently and quietly, she taught me that God was not the angry tyrant I thought I knew. She assured me that a relationship with Jesus wasn't about punishment or fear, but about something my father rarely mentioned, grace. She told me stories of Martin Luther and John Wesley and George Whitfield, who found in the grace of God the only answer to their sin and God's justice. She said that God's anger was, anger was real, but that Jesus bore God's wrath on the cross, turned it aside so that I might be rescued and receive the love of a loving father and the presence of a living son. And did I meekly accept all this lovely truth? Of course not. I fought against it. I fought against her. I grabbed for every weapon I could find, anger, reason, doubt, history, the failure of God's people, the pain and suffering of war, anything to deflect the flood of God's love from reaching my soul. But in the end, I gave up and turned to the love and forgiveness that Jesus offered. I needed his cleansing so badly. I remember clearly walking on the hill above the Purton Cricket Club one day and being overwhelmed by the comfort and strength he poured out. I would like to tell you that my anger and rebellion disappeared all in that moment, but that would be lying. I can honestly say, though, it was a turning point. With Auntie's help and through others at St. Mary's Church, I began to find peace and direction for my life. The rector, musically inclined, persuaded me to join the choir and my newfound faith was able to express itself in the newfound beauty of song. The Bible began to come to life for me, and I was amazed to find that it was not all a list of rules and punishments. Most of it, much of it, especially Jesus' life, was about the undaunting love of God for his rebellious people. Over and over again, I turned to John 8, to the image of Jesus standing between the sinful woman and the stones of her accusers. I was not, of course, completely cut off from my family. I went to Bristol often, especially when either of my brothers was home from France. Both were wounded at different times in the war, but by God's grace, even Eric, who was gassed, returned to almost complete health. And by God's grace, grace, our family grew healthier too. Having sons in peril mellowed my father and deepened his prayer, and the changes in me made a difference for him as well. I think he now sees himself a little more a recipient of God's grace and less a slave to God's law. Back in Purton, once I was able to get past some of my own hurt and anger, I was also able to become friends with some of the girls in the village. I was closest to Mary and Rose Shields. Mary was my age and Rose a little more than a year younger. Like my aunt, they were joyfully outspoken about loving Jesus and the beauty around them. We formed a little reading club and devoured together the works of Jane Austen, Elizabeth Gaskell, and many others. The Shields family were nonconformists and attended a free church in nearby Swindon. I went with them a few times on Sunday and often to their Wednesday Bible study and enjoyed that church immensely. It wasn't near as beautiful as a building as our St. Mary's, nor was it much larger, but on a normal Sunday there were over 300 congregants and the Bible study was always crowded. Much as I loved the grace and joy of St. Mary's, I found myself growing attached to Swindon Chapel and the exciting life of knowing, serving, and sharing Jesus that I saw there. Their pastor, Reverend Jacobson, had a deep respect for scripture and an abiding desire to lead others to faith. Mary, Rose, and I started a girls group in Swindon and together with our students grew in grace and knowledge of the Bible. When my cousin Niles returned after the war, it became inappropriate for me to stay on with Aunt Emily. 
I was sad to move out of her home where God had done so much for me, but she helped me to get a job at a bakery in Swindon, and I moved there in 1920. Mary and Rose also moved, and the three of us roomed together and gave our time to the work of Swindon Chapel. We started a choir, which the chapel had been lacking, and expanded our girls' group. One of the things I did not do was allow any of the boys to pay attention to me. I was past the worst of my anger, but I had sworn that I would never get married, and that vow was still strong. I gave the cold shoulder to any man who tried to talk to me. In fact, as I think about it, the only men I thought safe or allowed to influence my life were the rectors at St. Mary's and the pastor at Swindon Chapel. So it will come as no surprise that the one man who ever got past my hostility was also a pastor. In 1925, Lloyd Robbins returned from his studies in Canada, hoping to find an experienced pastor to work under for his first few years of ministry. His friends in Birmingham knew that Swindon Chapel was growing and encouraged Reverend Jacobson to take him on as an assistant. Lloyd jumped at the chance. At first, I took no notice of him. After all, he was older than I and much more educated. But although I didn't notice him, I am told that it was not very long before he noticed me. Don't ask me why. I'm sure it wasn't my face or figure. I hope it was my devotion to Jesus. He says it was all three. Lloyd has a fine voice, and Sue joined our little choir. Pastor Jacobson also put him in charge of the boys and girls groups, so Mary, Rose, and I met with him occasionally. I could tell he was one of those who knew Jesus by grace. Not that I expected differently, but I didn't trust someone just because they were religious. And when Pastor Jacobson allowed Lloyd to preach, I found his sermons thoughtful, organized, and encouraging. And that's as far as it went. I could see he might be interested in me, and my habit of rebuffing such interest was strong. I avoided eye contact, left the room when he entered it, and refused group invitations that included him. I couldn't avoid him entirely, but I did my best. Yet to my surprise, I found that my avoidance somehow fanned a flame of anger in me. I began to have flashbacks to my childhood and its hurts and found myself waking from nightmares, crying out to Jesus for peace. I don't know why this happened, but it did not endear me to Reverend Robbins. Then my father visited our church. He was, of course, Church of England through and through. And though our relationship had improved, he was not happy that I had joined as a sending chapel. Lloyd preached that day a wonderful message of grace from Isaiah. But my father was barely civil when he greeted Lloyd at the church door and began to criticize Lloyd and Pastor Jacobson and the church loudly at the bottom of the front steps. And I was furious. All my anger roared back, and before I knew it, I was screaming in my father's face. He yelled that I couldn't speak at him like that, and I told him he just hated the truth, and he lost it. He slapped me hard in the face, as he had when I was a rebellious teen. I collapsed to the ground, but got up at once and ran to the garden, tears mixing with the blood from my lip. Several minutes later, Lloyd found me there. I don't know how he had done it. Maybe it was his background as an army officer, but he had managed to walk my father away from the situation, calm him down, and in Lloyd's words, tell him just what a wonderful daughter he had. My father accepted this in something of a daze and finally dropping his gaze and mumbled something about, I don't want to be this way anymore. When Lloyd found me in the garden, he spoke gently to me and loaned me his handkerchief, but told me I needed to apologize to my father. I knew he was right, and so I went and found my dad. But before I could apologize to him, he apologized to me, and we ended up in a tearful hug. After that, all my defenses against the attention of Mr. Robbins were dissolved. 
We began to court at Christmas of 1926, and I loved getting to know this kind and gentle man. I loved his heart for people and ministry, his love for the word and the peace that God has given him. When my anger flares up, or I become inexplicably hard-hearted, he hears me out with patience, and he says just enough to reset my course. We married in December of 1927 with my father's approval, and I have loved almost every day of our marriage. Now that we have added the joy of parenting Lizzie, I know I need Lloyd more than ever, but I also look forward to sharing him with the Stokely Free Church, if you call us here to minister. Mm -hmm. 